Okay everybody, this is Moody Dashcam. Today we're in Brooklyn, more specifically Mill Basin, Brooklyn, and we will be talking about Anthony Gaspipe Casso. And we're gonna be going to the house that he built before he was put in prison. Um, now, he got the nickname Gaspipe from his father. Allegedly he carried around a gas pipe because he was an enforcer for the mob. They, they think that was one of the reasons. They also think another reason was maybe because he had um, hooked up illegal gas lines. That could be another reason. Either way, he didn't like that nickname for himself. So he only allowed his close friends to call him by the nickname Gas. Only his very close friends though. So there's a lot of information out on Casso because he was an informant. Whenever someone informs, there's so much information out on them that it's very hard to fit it all into a video. I would have to make this video two hours long. So, to avoid doing that, we're gonna be talking about his house and two of the murders that he um, was involved in. I mean, there's plenty to talk about, but just so we're not here forever and I don't put you guys to sleep. Okay. So, the house that we're going to is at 139 Bassett Avenue. If you look it up online, it's gonna tell you 136, but 139 is what's on the mailbox. Casso was regarded as a homicidal maniac. He, he confessed involvement to, in 15 to 36 murders. Pretty nice. Um, now, he never actually lived at the house that we are going to right now because he was on the run for a very long time, for like 30 plus months, like 32 or 35 months, I don't exactly remember the number. But um, the reason why he went on the run is because he got a tip off from his uh, quote unquote mob cops, Stephen Caracappa and Louis Apolito, who were both NYPD detectives that he had on payroll and um, he called them his crystal ball because he always knew it was coming for him. here so yeah he was on the run for the for the time this is being built and a little bit before but there's a lot of shady stuff that went on in this house there were like construction companies and unions that were paying the mortgage on the house while it was being built a lot of shady deals stolen materials all crazy stuff so he gets a architect named Anthony Fava, F-A-V-A, -A, however you pronounce that, kill me in the comments for it, right? Who, he's like a known, not, I wouldn't say a mafia architect, but he's helped build other things for people in the mafia. He helped build, build the 19th hole bar and grill, which was kind of Casso's and Vic Omuso's, um, one of their headquarters. And Vic was the boss at the time. So it was one of their headquarters. And he also built a restaurant for uh, Al Diarco's son, Joseph. He was an acting Lucchese boss. And so yeah, so he got his name from assuming these people and had him build a house for him. Now, one of the problems with working for someone like Casso is that he's a very unpredictable and ruthless guy. So after all was said and done, I think it costed him like a million dollars to build the house. I really think it was much more than that, considering that I read that just the doors alone costed $40,000, kind of insane. But he gets the bill from the architect and it's not really clear whether he got rid of him. That's a new Corvette right there. Um, it's not really clear if he got rid of him because of him not wanting to pay the architect bill or Anthony Fava just being too close to Castle's dealings with the house and shady stuff going on. So we ordered him to be killed after he built the house. And he ends up September 20th, 1991. He was found in a stolen car in Bensonhurst, stripped to his boxers, 
shot and stabbed and wrapped in plastic. That's the kind of stuff that you get when you uh, build a house for a, for a mob boss. And interestingly enough, after Casso went to prison and all this, the next person who owned the house was a guy named Carl Kruger, who was a politician on the New York State Senate. Uh, he was sentenced to seven years for federal corruption charges. So this house has a nice history of um, good owners, you know, good wholesome owners. So a little bit of stats on the house. It's 7,000 square feet, which is giant. You're gonna see it stands out. It's crazy at the end here. You actually see this house from the Belt Parkway when you're driving by. Big gray. My opinion, not the nicest looking house ever, but it is big and it is different looking. But this is the kind of uh, style he wanted, I'm assuming. Yeah, it was worth over a million when he built it in the 90s. Like I said, the doors were $40,000. There was an indoor gym, two roof terraces, a kitchen and living room on two floors, and the master bedroom. Look at this house right here. You gotta look at this? Looks like a museum. And the master bedroom was 30 feet wide twin walk-in closets, you know, the whole thing. I don't know what it was sold for most recently. You know what? Let me pull over here. I'll edit this out. I'm going to get you the, the price right here on the spot. You're going to get research right here on the spot. Okay, the estimate on Zillow, which is not always completely accurate, but is about $2.48 million. So still has a, a decent value, this house. I, pro I think it probably would go for more if it sold today, given the area that it's in, the size. But who knows, I'm not a real estate agent, you know. I'm just out here making videos for you guys. All right, we'll be pulling up on the house shortly. So as we, everyone knows, if you're familiar, he turns informant, enters the witness protection program, Got gets kicked out of the witness protection program shortly after, I think a couple years. Can you see his house already? Uh, for bribing guards, um, starting fights in jail, and eventually like falsifying statements. Okay, look at this perfect spot we have here, right, right up front. We get a nice view. So that is his house. It was vacant for a little while, and they, um, people were punching holes in doors and stuff, and there was a bunch of, uh, property damage, but it's all fixed up now. Like I said, it's not, a, it's not the prettiest house ever. I mean, if it's your style, then it's your style, but this is it. So he gets kicked out of the witness protection program, and... He says in a statement that he always hated rats. These are his quotes. I surely hate myself. I consider myself to be a better man than most people in the street these days, even after he was an informant. Um, in an interview, he's asked about his family, and he tears up because he can't really see them. You know, he's in jail. They all don't like him anymore because he was an informant. So he starts to tear up, and then the interviewer asks him, how do you feel about the victims' families of all the people that you've killed? And he instantly stops crying and goes, well, I didn't know them. Just goes to show you how truly insane his mindset was out there from the regular person. All right, I'm going to give one of the big murder stories that he has. Pro one of the probably more well-known ones in the interview I'm talking about, he talks about this story. So... And we'll shoot through mill base a little more. You know, let's try and get... Maybe I'll spin around here. We'll get a better view. We'll get a view from the other side. I'll make a U-turn. In 1989, a Gambino associate, James Heidel, H-Y-D-E-L-L, -L, attempted a hit on Castle. 
So Casso got his uh, mob cops to go and stage an arrest on him. Which he did. This is not a, an uncommon occurrence of how these guys kill people. So they go to stage an arrest. They put him in the back of the car. They end up bringing him to a garage where they actually killed and buried somebody in that very garage before, uh, probably a couple years before this, maybe that same year. And um, so they bring him to the garage, they land down, they tie him up, they put him in the trunk of the car. Then they go meet Casso. They get out of the car, Casso gets in the car, and Casso takes him to a friend's house or a house that he could um, handle that. Do you guys see that little that little door right there? Right there. It's like a little hidden rock door. Kind of cool. Um, Casso gets in the car, brings him to a friend's house where he could have this done, and puts him down in a chair. He says he didn't torture him much. Had he not tortured the guy that tried to kill you, you know, especially a crazy person like Casso. So he gets the information on who ordered the hit, who was involved, he kind of knew all this information already. After he gets the info, the interviewer asks him, and how'd you kill him? I shot him. You shoot him in the head? No, it's, I'm in someone's house. That will cause a mess. All right. So he goes, uh, where'd you shoot him? And he says, like, where? And he's like, how many times? And he goes, uh, you know, probably 10. And he's like, could it have been maybe 15? Ah, yeah, it could have been 15. So he shoots him a bunch of times. And the one wish that James Heidel had to Casso before he was killed was please make it so my mother could find my body so she could have closure. Casso agrees to it. His body was never found. To this day, his body has not been found. So he doesn't keep his word, Casso. Remember that for the future, everybody. Actually, we don't have to remember that because at 76 years old in prison, December 15th, 2020, he dies from COVID. At least that's what the headlines say. I read a little bit more into it and um, he actually had prostate cancer, hypertension, a bladder disease, lung problems, and then I guess COVID put him over the edge. But it seemed like he wasn't... Uh, gonna kick it for too much longer oh little last bit I have it written down here I have to say after he was on the run for 30 months he gets caught in Mount Olive New Jersey with his mistress as he's getting out of the shower the cops come and arrest him the FBI and they find $350,000 in cash all stolen FBI documents from his two mob cops and um a bunch of information on the Lucchese crime family, how much money they were getting paid monthly from all these different organizations and unions and all the rackets they had going on. So it really let, it helped the case of being able to flip Casso. And let me look over my list real quick here. Yeah, I think that's everything I have to tell you about Anthony Casso. For this video, I'm sure I'll be making more videos on Casso. Hope you enjoyed. I will see you in the next one.